So I'm going to be talking about vivid maps of climate change, which is uh, some work that came out of my dissertation uh, that I just completed this summer at Penn State. Um, so we know that climate change is complex. Um, it's multidimensional, spatially uneven, dynamic. Uh, it's difficult to see and kind of identify in our daily lives, and of course it's politically contentious. And so a lot of research is being done on this topic, which is then in turn communicated um, to the public by the media. And so maps are one way in which information about climate change is communicated to the public. And so these are just some article headlines, um, and they're all referring to maps, which were the key component of reporting in these articles. So even when they talk about four signs that the Arctic is getting baked by climate change or seven charts, they're actually talking about maps. Um, and so there were lots and lots of maps in um, of all the articles that I was kind of looking through to, uh, as a part of my dissertation research. Um, and so these maps of climate change, I think, are really um, what have been called maps that matter. And this idea of maps that matter forms some of the basis of this research. So these are maps that generate insights from complex, large, unstructured, varied data that have broad impacts to society and our environment. And it was a concept that was proposed in a research agenda article in the International Journal of Cartography last year. And in, in my research, I focus on the specific case of climate change where I assess what the design decisions and aspects um, of cartographic design may influence our thinking related to climate change. Um, so the goal of my research was to understand the design decisions that expert map makers make to connect with scientists to translate knowledge uh, related to climate change to audiences. So how do they kind of bridge the gap and how do maps bridge the gap between science and the public? Um, so for this research, I conducted uh, semi-structured interviews with 16 cartographers, visualizers, graphic editors at National Geographic, NASA, um, NOAA, and the New York Times. And so these folks go by many different names um, across these four organizations. Um, but I really focused on questions about how they kind of bridged this gap. Um, so the results of that was over 262 pages of transcribed text. And so this is a screenshot of Atlas TI, which is a qualitative data analysis software. And I just want to walk through um, each part of the interface. So on the far left-hand side um, are all of my codes. And so these codes were um, somewhat in, uh, decided before I completed my interview. So um, I, I kind of knew what questions I was asking and what kind of big themes might come out of my interviews. And then a section of the interview, uh, the codes were kind of decided on in vivo. So as I was coding the interviews and deciding on big themes, um, I, I saw some themes emerge uh, in, in the data. In the middle is the uh, transcription from this one particular interview with some folks at the New York Times. And then over on the right is how each of those blocks of text was assigned uh, one of my codes. And so you can see in the middle right here, uh, this block of text talks about audience and purpose goals, but it also is talking about things like uh, memory and storytelling. And so through my interviews, my participants really describe themselves as translators. Um, they constantly converse with scientists to identify clearly what the story is that they need to tell with the data, and they go back and forth with scientists to identify designs and wording that work for both the scientist and the final audience. They really see themselves as reader advocates. So in this example, um, the far left-hand map is a map by NOAA, not by their um, kind of outward-facing uh, group that works on communication, but just by NOAA scientists. And then um, the similar data was put together by the New York Times and really conveys how, how that um, process of sea surface temperature is changing over time. Um, very similar data, um, same topic, but uh, portrayed very differently. Um, and in doing this, in, in going through their process, they're really trying to make their content resonate with uh, audiences and, and potentially persuade them um, to think about uh, to think about climate change in a different way. And so the term vividness that I used on my title slide um, comes from the communication literature um, from the 1980s and describes content that's persuasive um, and attention grabbing through being emotionally interesting, concrete and image provoking, proximate in a sensory, temporal, or spatial way. 
And it's never been used in the cartographic domain, um, even while there's been previous research in cartography on um, persuasion, and there's been newer calls in, in our uh, community for research on emotion and, and cartography. Um, and so in this way, I felt like this uh, idea could encompass the majority of the codes that related to these design decisions that I was seeing uh, through my interviews with these uh, participants. Um, and so in all of my uh, coding of those interviews, there were 18 codes which really focused on aspects of design that my participants talk, talked about. So things like animation, data classification, um, adding novel designs, using a style guide, talking about visual hierarchy. And so over the next couple slides, I'm going to talk about um, some of these kind of bigger codes, some of the ones that had a lot of uh, quotations with it, um, and uh, talk about some of the exemplary quotes. So in nearly every interview, there was a conversation about the need to make important data salient or visibly different and noticeable. And so uh, this one participant at National Geographic talked about elevating the point of the map, that they wanted to really um, make it so that people say, yeah, I get that, I see what you're saying. And he said, it's not about dumbing it down, it's about shining a brighter light on the more engaging aspects and being thoughtful about that articulation, whether it be visual or organizational, to create a thread that people want to keep reading. That's the mark of success. And so uh, Lauren Tierney just talked about this in uh, the last session. Um, about kind of really making that thematic data uh, stand out above the base information, right? Maybe you use a monochromatic base map and then you have uh, your really important data uh, stand out. And so that's one way. Um, my participants also talked about really showing change over time and um, that climate change really needs to, to show that change. And um, so one, one way my participants talked about that was through animation. Um, it's one of the more popular ways of showing um, climate change because it uses time to display time. And so now with things like animated GIFs, these maps can autoplay in social media feeds. They can be easily shared and obviously they're pretty captivating to audiences. Um, in addition, my participants also talked about showing change over time in static displays. So this map of the melting of Antarctica was uh, in National Geographic magazine, obviously can't use animation, um, but really shows that kind of change over time. You can kind of see the movement of the ice um, into the sea and, and how that's kind of melting. Um, in addition, on the more artistic and emotional side of map making, my participants made comments about color and their connections to emotion. And so the cartographer uh, of this map, which is Lauren Tierney, um, <laughs> said that the color use, um, sh she really talked about getting across that the point is, is of the map is really he that it's heating up. Um, but for the background, maybe you want to just use like purples and blues. Um, but for that key data, you want to really want that to stand out with, by using red and orange to drive home that key point. And so they talked about these connections between color and emotion. And then finally, novel designs have been shown to increase interestingness, and so this comes from the data science literature. Um, and interestingness is, uh, leads to increase in memorability. And so the New York Times specifically talked about the use of novel designs and that these were memorable and important for making climate change tangible to their audiences. Um, and they, they do, talked about doing this in many ways um, through interactivity dynamics and then um, if you notice some of these places are now using things like VR and drones um, to really make their, their data stand out. Um, and I'm going to show you one example on the next slide of how they used interactivity and specifically just scrolling down the page to make uh, climate change tangible through scale. So the designer of this graphic said, quote, we're trying to put the reader as close to that place as possible to reinforce the idea that this is a real research study that's being done in a real place, in a real little orange, in a real tent, on a real ice sheet, to make this visceral. And he continued, we started you out so high, and we zoomed you in, and then we're like, oh, actually, this is happening in that one spot where that one data point is made real to you. We try to actually bring you into that story, and maybe by producing it in this way, that's going to stick with you. It's more memorable that way. There are hundreds of stories a day that come at you. You have to decide what to click on and what to consume. And so if we can make this surprising and more interesting, maybe all those things that we agonize over actually do make a difference to our reader. And so throughout the course of my interviews, a couple uh, key uh, 
codes really stood out as being salient themes in the interviews as they related to design um, and creating compelling climate change maps. And so these were uh, change over time, uh, salience and, and kind of draw, uh, drawing attention to their maps, talking about color and its connections to emotion, and then using novel designs. Um, in addition, uh, these cartographers also talked a lot about best practices throughout, um, throughout my interviews. So they were talking about things like cartographic uh, conventions, generalization, design of marginalia and layout, um, things like scale and visual hierarchy. And so together, I think these uh, first five uh, that came out of uh, first five themes that came out of my interviews um, really form this topic of vividness in maps. In addition, uh, I added one, which was uh, that it needed to show a topic that was relevant to society and the environment. And so um, this other key piece comes from that, uh, that agenda article on maps that matter. So um, th these maps, uh, to, to matter need to show uh, topics which are relevant to society and the environment. Um, and so I wanted to analyze a larger set of maps. So I talked to expert cartographers and then I wanted to um, kind of analyze a larger set of climate change maps. So I collected 242 maps of climate change and these came from the US print and digital media. They were published in English um, over the past six years and they showed things like causes and impacts of climate change. Um, and then I wanted to analyze these maps um, and understand the extent to which they employed these aspects of vividness that I um, put together that were informed by my interviews. And so uh, content analysis uh, is a systematic method for examining and comparing themes um, in, in communication devices. And you do, you do it by uh, developing a set of codes, which came out of my, uh, those kind of aspects of vividness. And um, it's become common in, in cartographic methodology <clears throat> over the past 10 years or so. And so what I did was I looked at each of these maps and I had a, a undergraduate research assistant who uh, also helped in the coding of these maps. And we rated all of them on the vividness codes <clears throat> using a five point Likert scale. Um, so this is the resulting data table. So you can see I assigned all of the maps a code and then, um, so some of these were the um, cartographic best practices, which we divided out, but also some of those aspects, uh, uh, the, they were the aspects of vividness that I talked about um, previously. So I analyzed that resulting data table with multi-dimensional scaling to identify how the producers differed and what aspects of vividness they employ in the maps. Um, so multidimensional scaling is a visual ordination analysis. It's a nonlinear dimension reduction. So there were um, uh, uh, many aspects of vividness and what it does is then puts that in a 2D plot. So here, uh, you know, it's a two dimensional plot. Uh, the dimensions here are arbitrary, so don't worry about that. What's important to understand here is that each point on this plot is a map. So, um, and that distances uh, show show difference and similarities. So points that are really close to each other are really similarly um, coded in terms of, are coded with uh, multi-dimensional, or with the content analysis, sorry. And ones that are really far apart from each other were coded quite differently. Um, the, uh, the vectors here are the vividness attributes. So these were the aspects that I coded on. And uh, the lines that are longer um, are more important in explaining the variance between the attributes. So just, I just want to quickly go over some of the differences in some of the major map producers that uh, I think you guys will care about here at NASIS. So National Geographic and the New York Times tend to fall on the more novel side of uh, the plot. So they tend to um, kind of use, uh, so this is like that, that interactive Greenland map. This is a two and a half D oblique view of a uh, superstorm in uh, New York City that National Geographic did a couple years ago. And so these folks are using novel map designs, they're using interactivity, they're using drones, animation. 
But they're also doing, they're also using um, cartographic best practices. So they have balanced layouts. Um, they use a, a balanced, uh, balanced use of white space. Um, and then they use salience and projections that are suitable for the data and really make their thematic data stand out. Um, on the other hand, uh, the National Climate Assessment, which puts out a report every um, four years or so, um, and it's put together by scientists who, uh, and then the report goes to Congress. And so these maps uh, are quite different than what you might see in National Geographic or the New York Times. Um, they're quite basic. They still follow cartographic best practices for the most part, um, but they're not using um, novel designs or anything like that. And they do focus on topics that are quite relevant to their readers because they're focused on, um, on, on uh, constituents of uh, policymakers. So, so they're showing things like um, drought severity and um, uh, things that we might actually encounter um, in our daily lives. So it was through this research that it became clear that some of the cartographers that I was talking to um, were doing more than simply following cartographic best practices. They were doing that, but, there's, um, but they were also adding something else. So there's a difference between the map on the left and the map on the right. They do show quite similar data. Um, and I think the difference here is vividness. The map on the left is ideal for a more scientific audience. Um, and the information is presented clearly, but doesn't attract attention in a vivid way. Uh, the map on the right is designed for a more general audience, and it is vivid. My participants would describe it as eliciting a visceral response. You can feel it. You actually physically move this map, right? You scroll it on the page. And these types of interactivity and design appeal to these broad audiences. So cartography is often defined as being a combination of art and science. And until recently, I think that the art has kind of been ignored in the research. And a vivid map is one way of identifying maps that I think fall at that intersection. A vivid map is one that not only follows cartographic best practices um, that has been derived from uh, decades of research, but also gives the reader something to hold on to. It stands out above the constant stream of information that we encounter every day. And so when talking about a map of climate change, we're fundamentally talking about a map that matters. These are maps which translate scientific knowledge into meaningful information for society. Um, and these are maps that pique interest, so th they, um, they kind of grab your, grab your attention, as well as being understandable in that they follow best practices, and of course, they're relevant to society. And with that, I'll take your questions. So we'll repeat whatever question. Oh, okay, sure. Okay, we have time for maybe one or two questions, depending on the length. Yeah, Martin. Yeah, um, so Martin's question was about uh, that vivid often is aligned with uh, kind of saturation of color. And um, yeah, it's something I thought about, but uh, the, the um, definition that I was deriving or kind of basing a lot of my research on um, talks about a lot more than color and it's, it's not really focused on that. It was more on kind of the emotional interest and um, making this kind of intangible thing um, tangible to audiences. So, yeah, I thought about it, but I, I, I think that potentially only may, might matter for cartographers and it's not really something that other people outside of our community um, might be thinking about when we're talking about climate change more broadly. Yeah. Um, in my data set, I didn't have, I, I didn't run into that, um, but this was a, this was something that's come up before because um, when you're talking about using novel designs, um, 
you trying to find that balance between using novel designs and things that are really interesting, um, but also following cartographic best practices, I think is a really difficult balance that we all as cartographers run into. But it wasn't something that actually came up in terms of the maps that I was analyzing. I don't think that any, I would say most of the maps fell into the not novel design category um, because a lot of them were coming from government sources and because that's a lot of who is making these maps. And I didn't show this other graphic, but uh, yeah, the majority of maps that are produced about climate change that are republished across even very prestige media oftentimes come from government sources who aren't using kind of novel, crazy designs. So yeah, but it's definitely something I'm trying to think about and how, how do you balance between novel designs and still show the information in a clear way. And so that's why I think that when we talk about this maps that matter, it has to be things that generate interest, but also are really understandable as well. Thanks. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Carolyn.